the powers that be, the elites are talking about universal basic mobility, UBM. And it all sounds good, right? I want people to be able to get around. And what's interesting is how this conflicts with the greenies and the environmental movement and how they want to make transportation more and more expensive. And hey, Joe Biden's been extremely successful at that. Let's go, Brandon. You know, the gas prices have more than doubled. I filled up my gas tank the other day and the car hasn't changed. The number of miles I can drive on a tank hasn't changed, but the price has changed. Hey, it's Jason Hartman coming to you from a world where the craziness and stupidity just never ends, does it? The things that are going on in today's world are better than fiction. You just can't make this stuff up. I mean, look at this. So this is Minnesota Reason Magazine, which by the way, excellent, excellent website. I, I don't know if they still have, well, I guess they do have a printed magazine still, but they're great. Check out Reason. You know, their tagline is free minds and free markets. And this article in Reason, I mean, you know, you, know, you just, you could, you could predict this stuff so easily, right? Developers halt projects, mayor demands reform after St. Paul, Minnesota, voters approve radical rent control ballot initiative. Well, I guess the, the voters think that free housing is a right or, well, you know, free rent controlled, whatever, is a right. And uh, those evil developers will just keep on building, building new, new homes for them to live in regardless of the return on investment. Yeah, it's, it's, you just can't make this stuff up. <laughs> Unlike almost every rent control law in the country, the ordinance passed in St. Paul by St. Paul, Minnesota voters includes no exemption for new construction. So why should we build anything? Yes, let's just stop building. <laughs> yeah. So 52% of the voters approve this. And, you know, it's only been a week since this passed. And the developers have just said, you know, screw it. Why should we bother? We'll just stop our projects right in the middle of them. And why should we keep building? You know, I mean, this is just insane, you know, and look at this, both California and Oregon, which passed statewide rent control ordinances in 2019, exempt buildings that are less than 15 years old from their price caps. New York's longstanding rent stabilization law mostly applies to apartments built before 1974 or to newer units that receive certain tax benefits. So I guess they were, even they, the socialist idiots in those places, were smart enough to say, look, we don't want to disincentivize new construction. We got a housing shortage problem. We want to keep the construction going, right? So we're not going to apply it to this new construction. But in St. Paul, they just think the builders will keep on building and supplying more housing regardless of the rent control laws. Yeah, yeah, just, just, it's just amazing. So anyway, check that out in Reason Magazine. All right, let's see here. What else? Oh, here's one for you. <laughs> You know, more stuff you can't believe, right? So when you create a bunch of fake money out of thin air, what do you think is going to happen? More currency units, more dollars chasing a limited supply of housing. And here we go, Wall Street Journal. Homes now typically sell in a week, forcing buyers to take risks, right? And we've talked many times on the show about something called financial repression, and financial repression, what it does, it basically eliminates return on investment for savers, for people who did the right thing, who saved money, who delayed gratification, who didn't take that extra vacation, didn't buy that bigger house, didn't buy that new car, didn't send their kids to that expensive private school, right? All these people that forego these, you know, life's luxuries, right? They didn't do that because they thought, you know, we got to be responsible. 
we've got to save for the future. We've got to save for a rainy day. Well, <laughs> they got screwed because savers are losers. Remember, the game changed in 1971. And ever since 1971, it has been a progressive attack. And now, with these very, very low interest rates, and by the way, there's a good website. I think it's called WTF, and you know what that stands for, 1971, right? And it's just got a whole bunch of charts and graphs, you know, right after every how everything just happened after Nixon cut the last tie to the gold standard in 1971, when he said that over 50 years ago, this would be temporary. He would temporarily suspend the convertibility of the US dollar to gold temporarily half a century ago. Yeah, you know, there's nothing so permanent as a temporary government program, as uh, Milton Friedman uh, brilliantly said. <laughs> oh, gosh. So what happens to these savers is that they have to go way out on a limb. They have to go further out on the risk curve, right? And, and what do I mean when I say the risk curve, right? Well, you know, you can have very safe investments or, yeah, and we'll call them investments, even though they're not investments, but we'll call them that. So a safe investment, what would be the safest investment in the old days? It would be a savings account or a CD or U.S. Treasuries, right? These would be very conservative, safe investments. But nowadays, because we have inflation, literally for the first time in probably any of our lifetimes, any of your lifetimes, certainly in mine, where we have the stated interest rate, the official mortgage rate, right, is lower by more than half. It's less than half as much. That's the proper way to say that, Jason. It's less than half as much as the stated, the official rate of inflation. Now, look, the official rate of inflation has been understated for decades, and we've talked about that extensively on the show. But now it's official that we have negative interest rates because we have inflation over 6% on the official number, which means in reality it's probably around 15%. That's my estimation. And you can borrow at less than half of that for three decades on a 30-year fixed rate mortgage. And that is nothing short of, of incredible. It really is incredible. So you're literally getting paid to borrow money, even if you borrow and never rent your house out, right? Just keep it vacant. You'll still get paid to borrow money. But if you rent it out and the tenant pays the mortgage for you and gives you a little extra every month, we'll call it positive cash flow. <laughs> that is a phenomenal deal. So the financial repression, let's go back to that. So these people, especially older people that have saved, that have deferred gratification, delayed gratification, they can't make any return on investment. And this extends, and so they have to take do more and more risky deals to get some return on their savings. They can't just put it in a CD. You know, in the old days, older people would put their money in bank CDs, certificates of deposit, and they would do something called laddering. They would have these CD maturity dates out of sync on purpose. They do that with treasury bills too and other investments. But it was common with CDs. It was talked about a lot in the old days. And so they would ladder these things so they mature at different times. And then they could renew them at different times. They could access the money without penalty and spend it at different times for their lifestyle. And unfortunately, it is so unfair because now they have to do all kinds. I mean, you, you got older people investing in Bitcoin, I, you know, and I'm not saying Bitcoin is bad. I, I would love nothing more than to see it succeed wild, wildly. But there are very powerful forces with standing armies, missiles, aircraft carriers, huge police forces and literally police states who want nothing more than to see Bitcoin fail. And betting against them is just kind of risky. <laughs> so, because remember, the main product of any country or its central bank, I mean, these, you know, it's like they're very affiliated, these two evil forces, <laughs> big government and big central banks, is their currency. That's their main product. And look, if you're in business and you have a product that you sell, a widget, right? You sell something. Do you love competition? 
No, of course you don't, right? You know, people tend to not love competition. They want it to be an easier open marketplace where there's less competition. Well, remember that old bumper sticker you used to see years ago? Don't steal. The government hates competition. <laughs> well, they definitely hate competition when it comes to their currency, their dollar, their yen, their euro, their their peso, their Brazilian real, whatever, right? They don't want competition. So we'll see. We'll see what happens with that. But but in going out further on the risk curve, look at what home buyers are having to do. This article in the Wall Street Journal, right? Homes now typically sell in a week, forcing buyers to take risk. Buyers are often waiving traditional safeguards in fast moving market where median price has climbed. And what this is showing us is another example of a dysfunctional world where buyers are having to uh, remove financing contingencies and put their deposits at risk, remove appraisal contingencies and put their deposits at risk, even remove removing home inspection contingencies and putting their earnest money deposit at risk. So if they make a deposit of say $10,000 on a home and they don't have any of these safeguards or contingencies, they have to go through with a deal or lose their money. So this is further out the risk curve when you have this dysfunctional type of world. And one more thing that you just can't make up. <laughs> This article comes from The Hustle, which is a great little newsletter. I'm sure many of you have seen it or are familiar with it. We've all heard about universal basic income, UBI. And even some of my most hardcore libertarian friends are coming around to the idea that UBI might be a good idea. And I must admit that I am even doing the same. I'm somewhat influenced by this. but. Like anything, it will become a corrupt cluster. <laughs> Sorry for the, 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 the language there, but you know, that word just works. <laughs> and so that's what will happen with UBI, of course, like, like it always does. It'll become a, a government boondoggle and, and a big scam. And the government will pick winners and losers. So it's, it's all going to happen. And the situation here now is they're saying not only do people deserve universal basic income, or they just get a check every month for nothing, for doing nothing. They don't have to be a productive member of society. They don't have to work. They don't even have to be looking for work. Everybody, just because they exist, gets a check, right? That's universal basic income. Well, now the powers that be, the elites, are talking about universal basic mobility, UBM. And it all sounds good, right? I want people to be able to get around. And what's interesting is how this conflicts with the greenies and the environmental movement and how they want to make transportation more and more expensive. And hey, Joe Biden's been extremely successful at that. Let's go, Brandon. You know, the gas prices have more than doubled. I filled up my gas tank the other day and the car hasn't changed. The number of miles I can drive on a tank hasn't changed, but the price has changed. It was about $35 to fill that car up a year ago when I bought it, and now over $72. <laughs> same car, same amount of mileage, same fuel economy. You get to go the same number of miles, but you pay more than double for the same result. Nah, there's no inflation. It's transitory, right? The, the, yeah. It's, and, and now, oh my gosh, the spin doctors, and we're going to do more on this on upcoming episodes, but the spin doctors have really, I mean, it is, they make no apologies. They're so nuts. It's amazing. They are now saying that inflation is good for the common man, <laughs> for, for the poor and the middle class. And it's bad for those evil rich people, those one percenters and those ultra rich people, when the exact opposite is true. That is such a bold faced lie. It is absolutely mind boggling that they are now trying to con the population into believing that inflation is good for poor people and middle class people. And it is bad for rich people. The 
absolute, complete opposite is true. Rich people own assets and rich people use debt productively. And guess what? Inflation benefits them. Of course, you know about my strategy probably of inflation-induced debt destruction. If you don't, go to jasonhartman.com, type in that long phrase, inflation-induced debt destruction, and learn how it is the hidden wealth creator, how people use self-liquidating debt with income property to really, really benefit from inflation-induced debt destruction. And this is a strategy of the rich. It's been a strategy of the rich for many years, and it works. It's a phenomenal strategy. But the poor people and the middle class people, they get totally screwed by inflation. Because guess what? Gas prices matter to them. Guess what? When gas price goes up or energy costs in general, the price of everything goes up because the cost of energy is in every product and every service. Things have to be shipped to locations, either to your house or to retail stores. You have to go to the retail stores. All of the energy consumed in producing that product or producing that service, providing that service, energy cost is in every single thing. So universal basic mobility, right? This is the new thing, right? People who have access to transit have more opportunities. Well, I agree with that. So why are you making gasoline so expensive by shutting down pipelines? This is like the first thing Brandon, Brandon did on the job, right? You know, his, I think it was his first day. He said, we are shutting down the Keystone pipeline. Absolutely. Boom. Done. And we're going to make lots of statements about how we're attacking oil and attacking fossil fuels. And, you know, when you buy services from these businesses like airlines, we're going to force them to buy carbon credits, which is, by the way, an epic scam. I mean, it's just that's such a crooked, epic scam how these companies and rich people like Jeff Bezos are doing what's called greenwashing. They are greenwashing their environmental sins as they fly around in their private jets, and not just private jets, but ultra luxurious private jets that are much, much larger than they need them to be, <laughs> right? It's, it's not just a little private jet to get you somewhere, right? They're ultra luxurious private jets. And well, I bought some carbon credits, so I'm okay. I can do all the environmental sins I want. That is, there's such an epic lie. It is unbelievable. And look, I don't have time to go into it today, but check it out, do your own research. Maybe we'll talk about it more in the future. So yes, people have more opportunities. So make transportation cheaper instead of subsidizing it, right? So look at this. A 2019 study found that between 1960 and 2014, poverty in the US fell from 24% to 14%. Okay, but households without cars, it slightly increased. The only place poverty didn't increase was New York City which has robust public transit system. Well, not to mention that you might get mugged or killed on the subway and you might catch a disease because it's so disgustingly dirty on their subway, but okay, sure, fine. You know, lots of social programs. So it's not just the transit, right? And listen, I'm all for public transit. I think it's a great idea. I mean, during the COVID times, which we will be probably in forever if the powers that be have their way because they want us to believe it's still a thing because if it's still a thing, they can exercise a lot more control over our lives, right? But <laughs> yeah, so a lot of contagion possibilities on public transit, but whatever, I'm all for public transit. I, I think it's great if it's done properly. So this is the thing. So in California, where they are always the leaders of these crazy government boondoggles that enrich all sorts of insiders and crooked politicians and special interest groups, right? Of course, they are leading the charge on UBM, Universal Basic Mobility. Several UBM pilots are underway and most work by linking services. So instead of just driving or taking the bus, you'd use a mix of public transit, shared bikes and scooters, ride and car shares. Okay, that's fine. I think innovation like that is great and piecing these things together is great. Then why is it that in LAX, in Los Angeles, the stupid government in LA has their version of mass transit, their you know monorail system or light rail system, it stops about a mile before LAX. Yeah, 
it's absolutely disgusting because everything has become a scam. And guess who didn't want the transit to go all the way to LAX? The taxi cab companies. Yes, they hired their lobbyists and a whole bunch of union groups also hired their lobbyists. They lobbied, AKA paid off the politicians in LA, the disgustingly corrupt politicians in LA, which by the way, is my hometown. That's where I grew up to say, no, you can't have the mass transit go all the way into LAX to make it actually convenient to take mass transit to the airport, right? It, it's just, and, and look at that, that high-speed train disgusting. I, I mean, I knew years ago when they announced that that would be an epic scam. It's massively over budget. The, the one in California that's supposed to take you from Southern California to Northern California and back, right? Unbelievable, total scam, total failure, way over budget. And guess who's getting rich? A bunch of crooked politicians and insiders, as always, right? Bunch of payoffs, bunch of favoritism, bunch of crony capitalism. So in Oakland, <laughs> Oakland, California, a mess of a place, right? About 500 participants will get a $300 debit card, I assume that's monthly, to use on public transit, bikes, scooters, and car shares, according to Bloomberg, right? In Bakersfield, California, a program will give participants free bus passes. Now, who's paying the bus company, right? Or, you know, or the Metropolitan Transit Authority or whatever it is, right? Free bus passes plus up to five rides per day on spin e-bikes and scooters. Well, that doesn't come for free either. Someone had to pay those companies to produce that stuff, administrate that stuff. And yeah, so spin is also involved in Pittsburgh's UBM pilot, right? Move PGH, a mobility as a service mass like SaaS, you know, software as a service app that integrates a variety of transit options, including electric mopeds. Folks, in principle, this sounds great, but in practice, like everything else, the government runs, the government touches, it will become a disaster. It'll become a crony capitalist scam, and a lot of people will just get paid off. Now, speaking of scams, I want to wrap up with this. There is a left-oriented reporter that I like, Matt Taibbi, and hey, he's a journalist, so of course he leans to the left. But this guy is sane, right? He's a thoughtful intellectual, and he really thinks things out. He's got a great book called Hate, Inc., which I, I recommend you read. And uh, Hate, Inc. talks about how the news media profits so incredibly well by getting people to hate each other, right? And how CNN gets all the folks on the left mad, and Fox gets all the people on the right mad, and they keep watching and they keep watching the commercials and it's great for ratings, right? I'm sure that's not too much of a surprise, but like everything in life, there are distinctions. There's just more to it than that. Anyway, check this out. You got to listen. I'm going to skip around this article. Matt does it on audio in his newsletter, which by the way, you can subscribe to for free. And he's got some great stuff here. So let's listen into this. I think you will really be amazed. And it's entitled, As America Falls Apart, Profits soar. We have become a kleptocracy, a plutocracy. <laughs> and this is stuff that happens around the world regularly, but it's such a shame that it's happening in the U.S. to the extent it is. Here it is. As America falls apart, profits soar. As the country again prepares to go to war with itself, this time over a high profile. And by the way, I'm playing at a faster speed here. Maybe I'll just tone that back a little bit. We'll go at 1.25 because we want to get you the information quickly. Okay, here we go. As America falls apart, profits soar. As the country again prepares to go to war with itself, this time over a high profile trial, a bigger story goes unnoticed. The mayhem watch is on. Closing arguments in the trial of Kenosha shooter, Kyle Rittenhouse are expected Monday. And after weeks of hype, the country is primed to explode again. Wisconsin Governor Tony Evers announced 500 National Guard troops will be on hand for potential post-verdict unrest, which seems almost guaranteed no matter the result. As with all major news stories lately, the Rittenhouse case saw idiosyncrasies wash away as coverage accumulated, with pundits pounding the trial into yet another generalized referendum on American culture war. Prestige media made Rittenhouse a stand-in for the Proud Boys, January 6th, school board protests, anti-mask protests, QAnon, Blue Lives Matter, Trump, 
domestic terrorism, fascism, school shooters, and every other naughty thing, with everyone from then-candidate Joe Biden to The Intercept blithely declaring him a white supremacist. Anyway, so he talks about the Rittenhouse trial, right, which is going on, and how there may be chaos around that, and we'll see. Uh, you know, there will likely be something happens. But, you know, Rittenhouse had this Proud Boys photo that he took, but it was after the shooting, right? It was after the event. So can that evidence be used at trial, right? That's part of the discussion he's having here. But I want to just speed this up to sort of part two about it, because here he talks about the kleptocracy that has become the modern United States, unfortunately. So let's go into that. The financial data firm FactSet released an eyebrow-raising report about the COVID-19 economy. The firm noted that companies in the S&P 500 were set to post a net 12.9% profit in the third quarter of 2021. They pointed out this was the second highest result since the firm began tracking the number in 2008. The only better result, the previous quarter, i.e. Q2 2021, when net profits sat at 13.1% overall. These results track with the true great story of the pandemic era, which not so mysteriously hasn't made the news much, while Americans have been tearing each other's faces off over issues like race and vaccination policy. The ma So you see how that is? It's uh, when I had G. Edward Griffin on the show, he's been on several times. He, of course, is the author of that great book, The Creature from Jekyll Island. He talked about how the thing that plays out in the media and Matt Taibbi's book, Hate Inc., also goes along these lines. The thing that plays out is like watching a wrestling match where it's fake, right? We all know wrestling matches are largely staged, okay? That, yes, they're kind of wrestling, but they're also doing it for the camera. And this is meant to just distract and divide people. And so much of that is going on. It is just absolutely ridiculous. And remember, it's like the sleight of hand, right? They, the magician distracts you over here doing something with this hand, but really in this hand, the other hand, right? He's doing the trick and he's deceiving you. And so this is what is going on at the highest levels of our, our government, our news media, the corporatocracy, the big disgusting tech companies, et cetera, et cetera. They are distracting us all from this. Massive widening of our already obscene wealth gap. Remember last year's long summer of riots, that period that saw the whole world arguing over the definition of mostly peaceful and saw Rittenhouse go charging into the streets of Kenosha? During that long stretch of unrest, corporate America, which had been headed for a depression in March of 2020, was soaring above the fray on an apparently endless and endlessly escalating ride to record profits. Corporate profits in the second quarter of 2020 sat at $1.58 trillion. $1.58 trillion. Remember, the GDP of the entire country is just over $20 trillion. And a lot of that GDP is fake news because, of course, they count all these government projects. I, I mean, like, you know, Brandon's infrastructure thing will be counted in GDP. But is that really something that could be considered a product that America's producing? I mean, real GDP, there's a lot of debate about this, of course, gross domestic product, is not, <laughs> is not government programs. That is not real productivity. A year later, that number was $2.69 trillion. So now $2.69 trillion. So more than 10% of GDP. These are just corporate profits, just corporate profits. And they're all being concentrated into just a very small number of companies. A roughly 71% increase. How many stories have you read in the last year telling you about how well the top end of the income distribution has been doing while the rest of the country seem to be falling apart? Compared with how often you heard pundits rage about the insurrection, how regularly did you hear that billionaire wealth has risen 70% or $2.1 trillion since the pandemic began? How much did you hear about last year's accelerated payments to defense contractors who immediately poured the rescue cash into a buyback orgy or about the record underwriting revenues for banks in 2020 or the embarrassment of profits for health carriers in the same year or the huge rises in revenue for pharmaceutical companies? By the way, on the banks, another big boondoggle, another great example of a government boondoggle is PPP and the COVID relief programs. Because Jamie Dimon, you know, our, our friend at, at Chase, <laughs> I mean, he's made an absolute fortune off of this. And I guarantee you, you will hear more and more stories about incredible amounts of fraud 
And you already have, right? We, we've already heard lots of those stories. Incredible amounts of fraud and scams with the government COVID programs and all sorts of extremely profitable companies taking the relief. It wasn't meant for any of this. But of course, it's all an insider's game, right? It's just all an insider's game. Thank you to all the lobbyists. Companies like Pfizer and Johnson & Johnson, all during a period of massive net job losses. The economic news at the top hasn't just been good, it's been record-setting good during a time of severe cultural crisis. 20 or 30 years ago, the big lie was usually a patriotic fairy tale designed to cast America in a glow of beneficence, nurtured in think tanks, stumped by politicians, and amplified by Hollywood producers and media talking heads. These whoppers were everywhere. America would have won Vietnam if not for the media. Poverty didn't exist, or at least wasn't shown on television. Only the Soviets cuddled with dictators or toppled legitimate governments, etc. The concept wasn't hard to understand. Leaders were promoting unifying myths to keep the population satiated, dumb, and focused on their primary roles as workers and shoppers. In the Trump era, all this has been turned upside down. There's actually more depraved, dishonest propaganda than before, but the new legends are explicitly anti-unifying and anti-patriotic. The people who run this country seem less invested than ever in maintaining anything like social cohesion, maybe because they mostly live in wealth archipelagos that might as well be separate nations, if they even live in America at all. All sense of noblesse oblige is gone. The logic of- Noblesse oblige, he says oblige, I think oblige is the right way to say it. So, you know, if you're not familiar with that phrase, it means nobility obligates. Nobility obligates. It means that if you're in a certain position of power and wealth and influence, you should do the right thing because nobility obligates. It has an obligation that comes with it. And of course, Matt Taibbi is saying that's just completely gone, which he's right. For a kleptocratic economy, has gone beyond even greed is good mantra of the fictional Gordon Gecko, who preached that pure self-interest would make America more efficient, better run, less corrupt. Even on Wall Street, nobody believes that anymore. America is a sinking ship, and its CEO class is trying to salvage the wreck in advance, extracting every last dime before battlefield Earth breaks out. It's only in this context that these endless cycles of hyper-divisive propaganda make sense. It's time to start wondering if maybe it's not a coincidence that politicians and pundits alike are pushing us closer and closer to actual civil war at exactly the moment when corporate wealth extraction is reaching its highest ever levels of efficiency. Keeping the Volk at each other's throats instead of pitchforking the aristocrats is an old game, one that's now gone digital and works better than ever. That might be worth remembering after the coming verdict and ahead of whatever other hyper-publicized panic comes down the pipeline next. Okay, if you want to subscribe to Matt's newsletter, he's got a free one and a paid one. You just go to Taibi, which is T-A-I-B-B-I dot substack dot com. Check it out. It's, it's good stuff. And of course, you know, he generally, I think, leans to the left. Not Well, not even leans, but he's, he's on the left. <laughs> okay. But, you know, he makes sense. I mean, it's hard to argue with this stuff. It, it's, it really does make sense. Anyway, look, the most historically proven wealth creator in the entire world is income property. And this is a way that you can fight back, not by betting against these powerful forces, but by aligning your interests with them. And if you need help with that, go to jasonhartman.com. You can also get my free book. That's a free mini book. It's not long. And you get it just right away. It's instantly emailed to you at pandemicinvesting.com, where we've adopted many of my strategies that I've been teaching for many years to the pandemic era in which we live. So that's at pandemicinvesting.com. Yes, I did get that domain name. Pretty good, huh? <laughs> Pandemicinvesting.com. And then main website, jasonhartman.com. Of course, more podcasts coming up, more on YouTube coming up, as well as a report from the conference in Miami I was at this weekend. I was at Mark Moss's conference. I had dinner with George Gammon, Gerald Salente. Gosh, who else was there? Of course, Mark Moss was sitting on one side of me. George was on the other it was just a, a great time. We, we had a lot of good discussions and I'll report on that maybe on uh, the next episode. Anyway, that's it for now. Happy investing, everyone. Pay attention today or nowadays is a time when we really, really need to pay attention because we are just getting attacked from every angle. And one of the best ways to fight back is to simply buy good income properties, buy properties that make sense the day you buy them, take advantage of inflation-induced debt destruction and so many other benefits. 
And you can learn more about that, of course, at jasonhartman.com. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.